Great, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ted Tenoff. I'm a managing director and uh, senior biotechnology analyst at Piper Jaffray. Um, our next presenting company is BioLife Solutions, and here to speak with us is CEO Mike Rice. Mike, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ted. I'd like to thank the Alliance for this opportunity to talk about BioLife. Absolutely, yep. So, at a high level, start us off by telling us um, about BioLife's business. What do you guys do? Sure. So we're a Seattle-based life science tools company. Specifically, we're focused on providing biopreservation tools and services to help our customers improve yield, extend stability, and really enhance delivery and distribution of time and temperature sensitive biologic materials. So Ted, in the audience, we have two broad product uh, platforms. The first is this biopreservation media product platform with product brand names such as Hypothermosol and CryoStore. Many of you in the audience are familiar with those brands as you've incorporated those products into your own cell therapy clinical trials. And more recently, a, a really innovative and disruptive cold chain logistics and management solution branded as Biologistics, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Great, so starting off with the preservation media area, um, describe in a little bit more detail what your product offering is in uh, this space. How are these products differentiated and how do they add value to your customers? Yeah, great. So many years ago, some scientists at BioLife who were researching organ preservation and, and some other uh, cold preservation technologies really discovered that the, the slate of homebrew technologies and homebrewed media, which are culture media based or saline solution based, with some serum or protein or DMSO added to concoct a, a freeze media, they, they do a, a nominal job at ensuring cell stability and recovery upon uh, thaw. So, but these, uh, these scientists unlocked and discovered some of the mysteries of preservation-induced cell death and some very speci uh, specific molecular cell stress pathways that are uh, engaged once you subject cells and tissues to cold temperatures. And so they basically re-engineered or reformulated a new class of biopreservation media products, both for freezing, again, cryostore, but also for 2 to 8C shipping and storage, and that's the hypothermosol product. So our customers, these cell therapy manufacturing companies, have embedded or have baked into the, their own clinical trial and their manufacturing processes our products that are, again, used to store, ship, freeze, transport, and in many, many cases to actually be the vehicle delivery solution uh, to administer the cells to patients. So every day around the world we have clinical trials being managed by our customers where patients are receiving those cell-based therapeutics infused or injected uh, with our product as the actual excipient reagent in that case. Great. And regarding the cold chain logistics side, what really is used today? What are the, um, you know, process to ship in, to pack and ship cells and how does uh, biologistics protect a customer's cells specifically in terms of increasing yield? Yeah, great question. So the current slate of tools and, and packaging options that are available today really depend on the temperature range chosen. So of course there are liquid nitrogen doers uh, and then in the, the dry ice mode there are a number of companies that sell dry ice shippers and then some 2 to 8C shippers that have a variety of cold packs that are conditioned either in the freezer or in the refrigerator. And then some at CRT or controlled room temperature, again with some phase change material or PCM-based cold packs. So Biologistics is really an innovative solution that combines both a high-performance thermal shipping container with embedded electronics that can help customers track and trace their shipments across time and space and not only monitor but be apprised of or be alerted to temperature excursions, the GPS location of the shipment, when the shipment is delivered, when it's opened at the destination, uh, but most importantly, how much shelf life or stability remains. And we think that's a really innovative differentiating feature because our customers, the shippers of these, again, these time and temperature sensitive biologics, can configure email and smartphone alerts so the destination contacts, be it the pharmacist, the warehouse, the oncologist, the oncology nurse, can be recipients uh, of these alerts and know the package has arrived, it's open, but there may be just a few minutes of stability left. And why is that important? Well, they would be really energized to go and find that package, get it to the bedside, either get it thawed or get it ready to be infused within the validated stability period. So that's, a, we think, again, a, a real key differentiator. Well, and this is a theme that I've really picked up on and been thinking a lot more about today, uh, the whole concept of, of logistics and uh, getting the right, you know, 
going through the whole manufacturing, expensive manufacturing process, and then getting the cells there and either not infusing them properly. And it's part of the conversation that we had with the uh, first panel this morning. So what, how do you guys define the risks um, with respect to cell therapy logistics? How do you have that conversation with your customer? Yeah, great. So we think that there are two uh, main pillars of risk. The first would be clinical, and that would be uh, infusing or administering a cell dose that was exposed to a temperature excursion or for some reason the cells uh, weren't viable, right? And so there's the clinical impact of are we going to kill the patient if we infuse a bunch of dead cells? Maybe not. Is the patient going to respond therapeutically? No. The impact on a small-scale clinical trial could be huge, right, if there's no response in a certain number of patients. Uh, but then the economic side for an approved product, uh, the risk of having to scrap a dose which may have COGS in the thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar range, and, and if we're lucky, uh, perhaps be reimbursed at ninety thousand dollars or more. So that uh, that non-reimbursable economic risk could be something that again could make or break the difference in a commercialization aspect. I will say that uh, we did uncover um, uh, some pitfalls in the way that uh, cells and tissues are being delivered today, and that is that while they're put in a foam cooler or perhaps they're put in a, a vacuum insulated panel container, and perhaps there's a data logger in, uh, included. It's very rare that the data is uh, analyzed before the patient uh, is infused. So these cells may, in fact, have been exposed to a temperature excursion and they may, in fact, be dead. And I think the mystery here that we're trying to unlock and help our customers uncover and be aware of is that uh, we want to know that the cells arrived alive and they're going to actually do what they're supposed to and actually be functional as they uh, arrive at the destination. Excellent. So I'm going to skip around just a little bit here, but... You know, thinking about the composition of the business right now, tell us sort of what the status is of your customer's pipeline. Um, I know you have a lot, lot of customers that you're working with. When could some of these clients gain approval, and what would that mean to BioLife's business? Yeah, so um, if we were having this conversation five years ago, it would be a lot of pipe dream in future, but I'm glad to say that now we can see over the next few quarters, we actually could anticipate some customers getting their BLA submitted and approved, and they would commence large-scale commercial manufacturing. So to us, it looks like, particularly in the immuno-oncology space with CAR-T cell therapies, and we've heard earlier today from some of the other uh, panelists and speakers, toward the end of this year and first quarter of next year, and clearly 2017 will be a breakout year. How we monetize those opportunities, and you can see in this slide here, you know, there are over 200 customer clinical trials where our products are embedded in the manufacturing process. The annual revenue potential from any one of those ranges from a half a million dollars to $2 million per year. Again, based on clinical indication, how many doses our customers going to manufacture, the liquid volume of our media in a dose, and what they pay us on a cost per mill basis. Excellent. So what kind of business did BioLife do last year um, what were your sales, and what are you guys guiding to for 2016? Yeah, sure. So we did $6.4 million last year in revenue. The guidance that we've uh, issued for this year in 2016 is at least $10 million in revenue uh, with 25 or 30 percent growth in the core of biopreservation media business. If you put those 25 points or so in the 6.4, you can see that's about eight. So you can see we're guiding to a couple million dollars toward the end of the year in biologistics cold chain revenue. Excellent. And how big do you foresee this market ultimately being as we really move into an age of cell therapy? Yeah, great question. So I think the way that we would ask you to think about this is any group or organization that's shipping time and temperature sensitive biologics is a potential customer for biologistics. However, if we want to kind of scale that down to the, the true addressable market, that's the small form factor, small payload section or subsection of that market. There are easily a million or more cold chain shipments processed every year, everything from liquid nitrogen to controlled room temperature shipments. And in containers ranging from, again, small form factor, one dose in a box, to palletized containers or insulated temperature controlled holes in cargo ships and things like that. We think that uh, if, you, if you think about cell therapy, 200 customer clinical trials that are using our media, the rest of the space not using our media, uh, that biologistics could grow to be a really meaningful revenue and margin contributor for BioLife over the next few years. Cool. Excellent. So, Mike, help us understand a little bit in terms of what's on the horizon for BioLife, either in terms of internal new product development or even as you sort of uh, scan the landscape, external potential transactions or acquisitions. 
Yeah, great. So I think uh, 2016 is a year that we're going to be very focused on uh, deploying additional Evo smart shippers. We have a number of additional software features in our biologistics app that we'll be developing and deploying uh, with a lot of innovative logistics-based and, and customer-friendly improvements that will help customers, again, even get more value out of it. On the external front, thinking about acquisitive growth, uh, we do scan the horizon all the time. Uh, we're pretty picky about things that would sort of fall to the bottom of a filter. First and foremost, whatever the product or company or technology is would have to be in the biopreservation tools wheelhouse, right? So we're not going to be acquiring culture media companies or centrifuges or devices or things like that. So in our wheelhouse, the sweet spot there. And then it has to be a, a company or a product that has revenue. So we're, we're well down the path. We're not going to be investing in science projects and developmental projects. Yep. Speaking of, what is the uh, cash position at BioLife and how long do you expect that to fund the company? What's your view of profitability and when, when do you think you get there, either from a time standpoint or a top line estimate? How, how do you think about profitability? Yeah, all the time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so great question. So we ended last year with about $4 million in cash. Uh, we did file a shelf at the end of last year. At some point we may decide to do a little top off round. Um, we think that we have enough cash and we'll generate enough cash based on the biologistics ramp to break even sometime this year, most likely toward the end of the year. So, so far, things are holding, it seems fine, but uh, nevertheless, filing the shelf was good housekeeping, and if the market conditions are right, then of course we'll go out and do something. Yeah. Great. Excellent, I wanna stop and see if there's any uh, questions from the audience. Great, Mike, I wanna thank you very much for joining us and telling us about the BioLife story. Thanks very much, Ted. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks. See you later.